Hello and welcome to the ICIS Chemical Inclusion and Diversity Panel. My name is Leila Mackenzie Dallas, founder and CEO of Dar Global and the Mackenzie Dallas Charitable Foundation, supporting all aspects of visible and invisible diversity. I'm joined today by a remarkable group of inspirational chief executives. Uh, these individuals are absolutely best in class when it comes to their personal and professional experience. We're going to be talking about why diversity and inclusion uh, is key to innovation when it comes to the global chemical industry, in particular, as we move towards a net zero carbon future. We'll be talking about why a diverse workforce will drive more effective decision making, innovative thinking for our consumers, our employees, our governments, and also for our investors. We've seen that CEOs really are seen now as ambassadors for change. They're expected to speak up about ESG and in specific societal issues. We've seen a huge movement as the last uh, couple of years has really shown us uh, that humanistic led leadership is critical to the way that we engage our business leaders of the future. Each of our phenomenal CEOs that are joining me today on the panel are beacons and ambassadors for change. They're expected more and more so in today's modern society to really step up to the parapet and talk about societal issues as well as industry focused issues. I'm joined by Bob Patel, Chief Executive of WR Grace, an absolute powerhouse of the industry, having had a number of decades worth of global experience. Dr. Ilham Kadri, Chief Executive and President of the Executive Committee for Solvay, also the Chair of WBCSD since January 2022. She's broken a number of glass ceilings and was number 26 on Fortune's Women's Power list. Jim Fitterling, Chairman and Chief Executive of Dow, a household name organization. Jim has enjoyed a remarkable career and is a real uh, beacon uh, for change when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community amongst many others. And finally, our very own Dean Curtis, Chief Executive and President for ICIS and Group Managing Director for LexisNexis Risk Solutions, part of the broader Relex Group. Each of our executives is absolutely leading the field when it comes to the chemical industry and why humanistic led leadership within this industry is so critical. This is an industry that has traditionally had a rather high degree of inertia and actually uh, we have a brilliant opportunity uh, now collectively uh, to be able uh, to really drive positive change for our future generations of leaders. Welcome all. And before we dive deep, I'm going to come to each of you to tell our audience a little bit about why uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging and equity is so important to you personally and to this industry itself. Bob, coming to you first. Well, Leila, it's great to be here with you and great to be with Dean, Ilham and Jim, people I respect and have known for many, many, many years. Um, I've come to become more passionate about DEI uh, given kind of my background. Um, I think for those who don't know my background as well, I immigrated from India back when I was about 10 years old in the mid seventies. And I recall we moved to a small town in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, east of Cleveland, Ohio. And we were maybe one of three or four people of color in the area. And I remember at the time, just wanting to fit in rather than uh, embracing the difference that I brought, um, including being called Bob today. Um, my given name is Bobish, uh, but I remember that uh, nobody could pronounce it and it was shortened to Bob and eventually it became Bob and uh, I embraced that. And so if you fast forward to today, I, I think um, embracing our differences will make us all stronger. And, and bringing that diversity of thought, the diversity of experience we have, um, how we were raised. All of those things, I think, make companies stronger when they embrace the diversity of thought 
and, uh, and include everybody. So it's not just about embracing diversity or diverse people only, but it's really including everybody, but allowing them to be themselves when they come to work. Oh, thank you so much. And I, I couldn't agree more with the sense of, of belonging uh, and really bringing one's true self to work, which I know for some, given what we've seen in, in a you know, hugely corporate environment, can be rather challenging. Um, and frankly, I imagine quite exhausting. I'm sure we can all remember a time in our careers where uh, we we walked into a room and perhaps felt like we didn't belong and the energy that took to to pretend to be something perhaps that we weren't um, is uh, is it, just an unfathomable thing really and so um, hearing you speak so candidly about that is is, is absolutely wonderful. Elam, coming to yourself. Hi Leila and thank you for having me. Well like Bob you know it starts by you know by your background. I grew up uh, in a humble home in Casablanca in Morocco. Uh, we're actually full of love uh, by my grandmother who raised me um, but lacking resources, natural resources. So sustainability started at home by the conservation of uh, natural resources. We didn't have a luxury uh, to waste so we didn't have potable water electricity arrived actually before potable was uh, uh, water was 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 running from the tape and at some uh, i mean very often it could have been not fresh potable water right so um why i am here i'm pure, pure products probably of diversity and inclusion inclusion and my grandma who who raised me used to tell me the, the a saying in morocco there are two exits for little girls one from your uh, father home to your husband's home so they were called to to, to have a, to make a good marriage and to find a good husband and the second exit used to be to the grave so she invited me and the girls and around me to really find our third exit or probably the third door which for me was education so uh, through my life I was I have been supported by my ecosystem starting from that grandmother who was a role model by my friends by my professors who, who gave me the passion of sciences colleagues um, I mean I, I worked uh, with Jim Fitzgerald in the same company Dow and and I was inspired actually uh, by you know role models like him um, and actually my name like Bob my I embrace my name which means inspiration uh, and she wished for me to be inspired all all my life through my journey to just become a better person and um, you know, at, um, through, throughout my career, I realized the power of uh, uh, companies, the power of strong DNI policies. When I lived in Switzerland and I had my first child, it was very hard to find childcare, believe it or not. And my husband at that time, both him and me, we have a dual career. He had two weeks paternity leave, first time and the unique time in my life. I was, I thought about leaving a job, and because there is no choice to be made between a kid and a job. Um, and by the way, my first and proudest me measure I took uh, when I joined Solvay, 16 weeks parental leave, independently of your orientation, including for fathers uh, and, and co-parents, regardless of their orientation, because you need to help men to help their spouses climb the, to the top. So all in all, um, yeah, diversity is always in which individuals are different, whether visible or not, like you said, Leila, it's not only gender, it's origin, it's way of thinking, it's orientation, it's ethnicity, it's disability. I suffered from dyslexia in Morocco. I still suffer from dyslexia. Um, and at that time, you, it, dyslexia was not recognized. You were just stupid. Uh, but it's important that we, we embrace all of it. They are equally important. So uh, that's what I I'm, I'm, I'm here. I've been given a ch chance. I took it and I got, you know, several role models, mentors and sponsors who supported me through the journey. Back to you. Thank you ever so much. And I'm so pleased that you gave the story of a real model, your your grandmother, and also uh, that I'm joined on a panel with a fellow dyslexic. I too am dyslexic. Uh, and, uh, and for many years, it, it was one of uh, those aspects that was hidden away. Actually, uh, this is a neurodiversity that now 
we've seen really come to the fore as, as somewhat of a superpower. That innovative thinking and that difference is, is simply a, a great thing, uh, in particular around the boardroom table where we desperately need more innovation uh, within our 21st century modern organizations. Jim, coming across to yourself. Yeah, Layla, thank you for the question. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here with Bob and Ilham, uh, who I've worked with for a long time and really two great leaders in the industry. You know, I, um, I grew up on a small farm in a, in a pretty small town in Missouri. And um, after college in Missouri, I came to Dow literally like two weeks after that. And it was one of my uh, first uh, new experiences. And, and through working at Dow, I had the chance to spend 11 years in Asia. I've lived in five different countries and about eight different cities. And so I got a little bit of international experience. And that, that part of diversity was always strong at Dow. And Dow had focused on uh, gender diversity. My own particular situation, um, I, I was gay, but I kept that part of my life separate uh, from my work life for most, most of my career. Um, which in and of itself, if I look back now, created a lot of struggles. Um, I, I could do that, but it creates a lot of tension in the mind. And um, I was becoming chief operating officer for the company, and I'd had a bout with um, stage four cancer, which had created um, a, a lot of physical issues for me. And, and during the time that I was in the hospital, I just kind of sorted through my life and decided that um, I could take some stresses out of my life. I changed several things. One of the key ones was um, I went and talked to my boss, uh, Andrew Livers at the time and said, uh, I need to share something with you and I, I want to come out. And that started a process um, in Dow where um, Andrew actually um, had me um, talk to each one of our board members individually. They all supported me. I, um, I worked very closely and talked to my team, talked to the representatives of our LGBT uh, GLAD network internally. And then I came out to all the employees on a webcast uh, in front of 53,000 people on uh, coming out day, one October. And it was a, a great conversation because I think it took what I felt was a good culture in Dow to a completely different level. And, you know, I would just close by saying uh, the support I got uh, couldn't be better. And just to make a plug for the industry, I have never um, since that time, and even before that time, I've never seen any uh, animosity or, or anything negative uh, related to my coming out. There was no loss of business. There was no change in relationships with people that I've worked with for a long time. And I think it uh, reflects the mutual respect that we have for each other and the kind of culture that we need to develop. That is hugely important for different perspectives and for innovation. If you want to hire in this environment, you need different perspectives. You need people from all walks of life and your company needs to be human and you have to deal with these human issues. I think above uh, all, everybody's saying, yeah, we want to be contributors to business, but but most of all, we want to be part of something bigger. And that's whether it's working on climate, whether it's working on new innovative products, um, I think this is part of the culture that you really have to embrace and develop. Jim, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, sexuality is absolutely a key area of diversity inclusion and one of the invisible diversities that, that we've seen over the years some of the pain and strife that the LGBTQ plus community have really gone through uh, in order to fight to be their authentic selves and so to have yourself as a real uh, beacon uh, for the community is absolutely wonderful thank you very very much indeed and Dean last but never least coming to yourself Thanks, Leila. So I have a, a bit of a background in professional or elite sport, uh, football or soccer, depending on which side of the, the Atlantic you're on. Um, so I'm absolutely passionate about inclusion and diversity um, and human performance. And um, 
they are both inexplicably linked away from clearly being the right thing to do and being fair and just i i guess any high performance culture begins with inclusion because you can't get sustainable diversity without the inclusion bit coming first and all the statistics show that that diverse range of views skills and experiences as jim just mentioned provide the best outcomes for any business and indeed society and um, that, that that greater range of experience and skills create stronger teams they drive innovation and um and they're only sustainable with a with a high degree of psychological safety where people are able to be the very best version of their their true authentic self so um this this element of culture is always present in any elite successful or high performing team business or, or indeed community and i'd just like to to thank my esteemed panel colleagues for for what they do here i mean the the, the level of of authenticity they lead with and in terms of being their true selves and not being what they think the world needs of them is a role model for everybody in the industry and uh, just a, a massive thank you for your leadership there that just makes a huge difference to everybody outside of the industry too so thank you um, and I guess our job as leaders, you know, taking those those hard steps up is to make it easier for others to, to you know, to, to take the elevator and, and achieve wonderful things. And that's the culture that we try to create. You know, myself, as, as you can and see and hear, I am a, a male, white, middle-aged Anglo-Saxon ally um, who has had the wind on my back more often than not through my life, uh, uh, certainly more so than, 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 um, than, than everybody on the panel today. I didn't have the best upbringing, but it certainly wasn't the worst either. Um, uh, particularly, obviously, growing up in the UK, that that helped. I ha I have lived around the world too, which has I think helped my perspective uh, hugely. Um, but I started in the world of private client stockbroking and uh, not having a degree, and both my parents coming from um, poorer backgrounds in the UK uh, made it a challenge. But um, I think you used the word earlier, Leila, that you know ultimately that that kind of will became my superpower. And um, so, you know, for me, inclusion taps into a lot of uh, underutilized and often marginalized talent pools, which to be honest, I was then in that particular area um, and, and drives a quality and belonging. So I'm passionate about all facets of, of inclusion and diversity, but especially silent exclusion, such as social mobility and socioeconomic um, so yeah that's pretty much me i'll hand back to you i mean thank you ever so much indeed and i know that all you have done over uh, your leadership journey has been really to champion those underrepresented voices and, and be a true ally which is so very very important in today's modern and, and very digital world where frankly uh, it's easy to forget about the deep uh, human centric parts of us which are so very very important and make up each and every one of us. Uh, and it's been wonderful just to hear as, as a segue into uh, this panel, how unique and diverse uh, all of your experiences have been in order to get to the place that you are today uh, within your career, uh, personally and also professionally. And Bob, I'm going to come across to you for, for one of our first questions here, um, given the fact that you are so well versed in, in global markets across uh, the incredibly broad uh, chemical industry. And I wonder, um, why is diversity, equity, inclusion so very important within the industry specifically? Where has it come from and, and what kind of unique challenges does the industry face, given the fact that it is uh, one that has been around for uh, as long as many of us can remember. Well, first of all, uh, the business environment continues to become more and more complex. Um, as you think about um, uh, all of us are, are trying to do our part to fight back climate change, um, the, the sustainability movement, um, markets are extremely dynamic. Five years ago, I think we would have all said we have a very global marketplace. Today, because of the unfortunate circumstances of what are, what's going on in Ukraine and, and the state of geopolitics, perhaps things are becoming more regional, but I would say that we will always be interconnected as a global uh, marketplace. And, and for our industry, 
I think understanding global markets will always be important. Um, I've worked in um, small towns, big towns in the US. I've worked in Singapore. I've worked in the Netherlands. And I've had very diverse teams that I've, that I've worked with over the years. And, and, and what I've learned is that um, that diversity of thought, the experience that people bring, like Ilham was talking about, I think a lot of us are influenced by our upbringing. Um, and, and I'm certainly one of those. Uh, my mother raised me um, and uh, you know she was, a, she was a school teacher in India and moved here with very little. And we, uh, we found our way uh, with lots of sponsorship and support. And I think, I think all of those experiences will be required to solve these complex challenges. Not everything will be mathematical. Some things will be. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, having a team where, where some, some folks are very analytical, some have more of the emotional sort of uh, aptitude, we need all of that because the, 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 in, the environment will be very dynamic. Secondly, um, if you think about the markets we serve, and I talked about serving global markets, we need to think about different cultures and different countries needing different things in terms of products and and, and services. And so I think um, all of that says that more so than ever, uh, diversity and inclusion will be very important. And I, and I don't want the word inclusion to be lost in this discussion because we need everybody. It's not just those who would identify themselves as being diverse, but we need everybody to make the company successful and for this industry to have its positive impact on the world. I love the way that you reference this being a role of all, Bob, and I, I, I absolutely concur. Uh, there is a, a, a vein of thought still that this is an HR issue, uh, and actually this is fundamentally a board-wide issue. You talk there uh, about the consumer, you talk uh, about the, the experience uh, that, that we have or all, all had in, in a global marketplace. Uh, all of that brings innovation uh, to the customer customer and consumer, as you said, but also to the employees internally who, um, you know, this is a you know, world where we have uh, now the, 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 most, uh, the most generations in the workplace than ever before. And so purpose uh, really is very much at the heart and center of that. And so um, it, it sounds very much like you've remained very connected when um, I know you, you famously, I think it was your mother came across with, with, with $12 in her pocket uh, to, to the States. And you think, wow, um, you know, it sounds very much like you've taken uh, those early day learnings and really uh, they have um, fed like a golden thread throughout some of the aspects of, of your career. Well, and, and you know, um, those sorts of stories of um, immigrants coming with very little, while they sound very common, I assure you, there's nothing common about each circumstance and each family that has to get established and make sacrifices. And, uh, and it's part of, frankly, what I learned from her was that um, it, it's really in service of others. She, she made the greatest sacrifice by giving up a great career in India to uh, have a better life potentially for her children. And, and I think um, if she's, she's just been a great role model for me and how I lead today. A lot of that has been formed by watching her and how, how she always thought of others before she thought of herself. And Bob, I must ask, because servant leadership is a rather famous term and one that I'm an absolute true believer in, but it sounds very much like uh, that is something that has been at the heart of your leadership style. How do I serve others? How do I serve my customers? How do I serve the communities? Um, how do I serve my employees? And, and, and you know, is that something that was really embedded uh, with yourself from, from an early age? It was, in fact, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. My, my mother, um, she, uh, because she couldn't teach in the U.S. when we immigrated, because she, her degree was, um, uh, she got her degree in India. Um, so she worked two jobs, saved up money, bought a carry-out um, donut coffee sandwich shop, and I used to help her run it in the summer. And one summer, I ran it on my own while she went to India for an extended time to visit family. And uh, she used to allow people to buy on credit. And it was literally a notebook where she would write down what, um, 
what, what somebody might owe her for the, 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 uh, the food and service that was provided. And I asked her, I said, well, what if somebody doesn't pay? Um, what do I do then if a week goes by, two weeks go by? And she says, you never stop serving somebody food who wants it. And uh, if they can't pay us, then we have to assume that they need the money more than we do. And I think, you know, that, that stuck with me uh, for, for uh, forever, frankly. And, and it's the ultimate sort of service of others. That is, a, that is a beautiful story. And I can see our panelists here nodding in agreement from, uh, from the early lessons of, of donuts on the stand to the global chemical industry um, and, and leading from the helm. It's, it's, really, it's really quite an, an epic, epic story. Um, and I'd love now, if I may, to, to come across uh, to, to Jim. Um, so I know that all of you have some, some brilliant personal stories and I'd love for everyone to, to hear uh, that behind these great leaders, actually there is so much heart and so much soul and, and that is uh, really, um, you know, clearly a big part of, of what I believe is, has made you all successful uh, in your own careers. Now, Jim, I wonder how are you and your, your company working to really address these diversity, inclusion, equity uh, gaps? Um, how are you creating this culture and, and how do you keep the, the momentum really going within your organization? Well, the culture starts at the top. And I, I think that's the responsibility of the leaders to set the tone for the rest of the organization. Bob talked about leading with inclusion. Uh, we, we focus on that first and foremost because the environment that we want to try to create for our employees is one where they feel proud to be part of the company where they feel inspired by the work that we do and where they feel like they belong. They, you want a culture where they feel like they don't have to uh, keep things away. They can bring themselves to work. They're, they feel proud of belonging and they can contribute at every level. And uh, one of the things I try to communicate to our leaders, especially our people leaders is you know, becoming a people leader in the company is, is almost like um, when you have children. At, at that point, it really ceases to be about you and it's about them. And you have to be other focused uh, about what's important for them. If, if you're not, then you can't possibly bring the best out of them at work and you can't create the culture that they need to thrive. We, um, we start at the top and uh, obviously we have a, a strategy around it. We have um, a, a very capable chief human resource and inclusion officer in Karen Carter who helps us develop that. We lean heavily on employee resource groups um, and our leaders are all part of employee resource groups. And we encourage that because uh, we encourage them to be not just part of a group that they can associate with, but part of one where they can learn something, uh, maybe a group that uh, they're not familiar with and that makes them comfortable. And to give you an, an idea, we have uh, 10 of these groups in the company uh, every, from our uh, Women's Innovation Network, which was the oldest, our, our LGBT network called GLAD, which is one of the oldest that we've had and one of the largest um, in the company uh, where 80% of the members are allies. Um, um, so we work then to ethnic uh, diversity, our Asian diversity network, our black uh, network, which we call global African affinity network, our uh, Hispanic Latin network. And we have a Middle East intercultural network that was created uh, because we were moving into joint ventures in the Middle East and, and big projects. And you know there was a time uh, around 9-11 in the United States where there was a lot of um, cultural misunderstanding about the Middle Eastern culture. And we created that network to address some of those myths and, and develop better understanding. We have a, a veterans network. Uh, we have a, a disability network, or, or we call it uh, an ability network uh, for people who have uh, uh, disabilities, but can still very much contribute to the organization. And then two that we developed uh, recently really to address young employees coming into the organization and older employees um, that are in the experience part of their career where they can share their life experience. RISE was for new employees and PRIME was for older employees. And one that I was particularly proud of is that, that 
that 50 plus um, year old group uh, kind of felt left out of all the other activities. And you would imagine it was also uh, predominantly a white male group. And so that gave them a way to connect. And if I had asked as the leader of the company, if I had asked the prime group to work with the rise group and share their experience, I'm not sure it would have happened. But naturally, when we created those two groups, they started to have events together and they started to share their knowledge with each other. And it was just a it was just a natural thing for them to do. And I think that has created a lot of positive will. Over 50 percent, we're, we're in the neighborhood of 53 uh, percent of all employees are part of those organizations today. And it grows every year. And we're taking it into all of our operations. It's beginning to work uh, with our customers uh, on product development. There was just a thing uh, we had this week uh, where they were recruiting uh, from our um, different ERG groups. Uh, we work on a lot of products that go into hair care. And if you have uh, textured hair, curly hair, um, that's an area where uh, our ERGs sign up to be part of the program to actually help test out products that our customers are trying. Uh, we do that uh, with recruiting and hiring. The ERGs are a big part of our recruiting and hiring. Veterans Network, uh, one of the programs we've launched recently was uh, to be able to offer uh, a program for a military equivalency of a degree. So if you have military uh, experience at a certain level or above, uh, that would count as a, a degree on coming into the company. And we've launched programs like um, we've joined forces with 110 and just just this past couple of weeks turned on the connectivity between their jobs engine and our jobs engine so that um, we can take jobs and make them available to underrepresented minorities to give them a chance. And the whole idea there is not only give them a chance at, at a job, but give them a chance at a career that will allow them to, to build income and income that over their, their career will allow them to have the next generation uh, to have a better life uh, than, than they had. And I think those are the kinds of things that really embedded into the organization. Of course, we've got governance structures uh, to manage it. We've got full support of the board and a, and a very diverse board. But I think those are the kind of day-to-day -day actions that people see and they can relate to. And those are the things that uh, help reduce the barriers and make the walls come down so that, as Dean mentioned, you can, you can create psychological safety nets you can create the ability for, for people to feel at ease. And that brings out their best performance and, and our best innovation and our best products. Thank you so much. I, I'm wondering where I start with all of the richness of everything that you've said there, but ERGs or employee resource groups as uh, they're commonly known is one of my very favorite subjects. And what's been curious to see and, and fabulous actually is over the last 10 years, these groups have really risen to the fore as strategic priority groups almost um, from what was um, often seen as, as nice to have. These groups are, are really increasing hugely in their their sizes uh, within organizations. And I was speaking recently to, uh, to well, to, to Verizon CDO, and uh, they said they had 25,000 uh, within the organization, 25,000 people. And uh, there was a real direct correlation uh, with the S from ESG uh, and their shareholders and the power of these employee resource groups. And uh, hearing you speak speak about the 10, which is a, a brilliant number that you're addressing so many different areas within that, uh, Jim, from visible uh, to invisible diversity, such as sexuality. It's just absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And like you say, this is, this is building currency for next generations to come. This is leaving uh, a legacy. And uh, you mentioned there the, the psychological safety in addition, something that is absolutely critical and something that all of you here on this panel are really curating by speaking out about personal experiences that creates the ability for employees to feel that they can truly uh, be themselves and, and, and that it is okay to then talk about these things. And so uh, what we see is this marvelous trickle effect uh, come out uh, through 
uh, the organizations uh, and this overwhelming sense of belonging. So it really, um, it builds this great picture, Jim, as you were talking of, of the momentum that is really uh, snowballed uh, through the organization. If I could for a second, just, um, you know, think about the next, I think the next frontier for us um, beyond the ERGs is, is make sure that all the people in the organization can participate. And if I, I can for a minute, our industry uh, has a lot of people who work in manufacturing and in the professional organizations. And a lot of times we hear about these programs and they're all geared at the professional in the organization. And most of the professionals have connectivity to the organization through their desk or their laptop. Many, many operators will work their jobs and they, they don't have a, a laptop at work. They don't have that connectivity. And we, we relied heavily on the smartphone and to take all of our HR, our ERG experiences, our, our social experiences with the company and put them in the hands of the operators on an app on their phone so that they can feel included in things that are happening. It was, it was always difficult in manufacturing for people to be able to participate because it was hard to get their time. You know, they couldn't walk away from their jobs. And we saw this during COVID. In manufacturing, you had to be on the job all the time. Um, whereas office workers went home and worked remotely, but manufacturing workers had to report in, supply chain workers had to report in. As we dealt with coming out of COVID flexibility, well, the flexibility had been tested out with the professional workers, but with the plant workers, there wasn't much flexibility. So we're looking at creative things that we can do. One of them is give them the time to participate in the ERGs, look at shift schedules differently, look at things that we can do differently for them and get creative about how we can include them. And that has really resonated with them. Uh, we've, we've done things with, um, parental leave for both parents, regardless of uh, gender or sexuality. Um, that's been a, a big hit. We, we've done things to pull them in. We even did some things in some turnarounds last year, some big plant turnarounds, big maintenance activities, where the ERGs were on site in the common area of the turnarounds when the employees would come off the work shift and into the cafeteria or the, the lunch tents to, to have their meals the ERGs would be there engaging with the employees, talking about how they could get engaged. And it was a real positive in the manufacturing organization. I think if we can go to that next level where everybody can be involved, it's really gonna make a difference. And we like to think about it this way, you know, inclusion is our culture. Diversity is about our people and equity is really about fairness in all of our practices and policies and processes. And if we can get those three things right, then uh, I think it's it has definite, I can show you hundreds of examples where it has definite bottom line impact. Jim, thank you for that. And, and it's uh, what, what's intriguing is that you mentioned here shift workers and manufacturing, and, and, and these are really um, certain areas that are, are very, very well known um, within the chemical industry. They're unique, in fact, to the chemical industry. And so there are the nuances um, when we look at the lens of holistic diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity, actually making them um, really um, unique uh, to the industries in which we work is also absolutely, absolutely critical. Uh, it's about um, you know looking at the fact that there are very different uh, models for success or, of DEI within each of um, the, the different industries, and so the fact that you're really uh, you know mending shift patterns and things like this, um, that you're looking at those um, you know boots on the ground uh, and looking at how they too can be involved in, in ERGs is absolutely absolutely key. And, um, and, and and finally, before we move on to, to Ilham, I wonder, um, in, in line with the industry and also uh, with many of the achievements uh, that you have, um, you know, ha have, ha have achieved throughout um, your, your career, which, which are you most proud of? I think uh, most proud of the way that the team handled the last uh, two years on, on top of COVID. Uh, we had uh, a 500-year flood here in Midland that, that really had a big toll on the community. We had, um, we had two hurricanes in the Gulf Coast, uh, which had massive impact uh, on the industry. We had a freeze in Texas uh, last spring, which um, 
really took the whole industry in the Gulf Coast out for a quarter. And uh, on top of you know, an already tight supply chain really created a, an unbelievable supply chain. And on top of all that, the, the company delivered record results last year and our turnover rate was uh, one of the lowest in the industry. It's well below 5%. And you look at that and you say, why? You know, why does that happen? And that happens because your people are engaged. Uh, they feel pride of ownership. Uh, they feel like they belong and they're working for something bigger. And, um, you know, we didn't have to push anything. In most cases, we just had to get out of the way and um, give them the freedom to do their work. And I think it shows that they appreciate that. Ilum, I'm coming to you for, for the next question. And I, I know that you've famously talked a lot uh, about STEM, about breaking glass ceilings. And I wonder how do you measure progress uh, within your organization? What does success look like uh, within your business? Yeah, well, first of all, you need to have uh, a strategy around diversity, equity and inclusion and actually make it part of your business strategy. So. At Solvay, when I joined back in March 2019, uh, we launched our growth strategy, we launched our Solvay One Planet, which is our sustainability agenda around three pillars, climate, resources, and better life about the people. And I was wondering with my team how we can move the needle, because frankly, if there is uh, one area where I don't feel as, as a leader, as a citizen of the world, I made an impact. It was really in the diversity area because, you know, the numbers are still sobering. You don't see many much diversity at the top. So um, we looked at this and we realized that diversity is, is, um, is what you see, but equity and inclusion is what you do. And we launched our Solvi One Dignity, which is our new program to drive a cultural change, very much what Jim was talking about. And really not only reinforcing the company commitments, but really, you know, eliminating uh, and voicing any form of discrimination and cultivating an inclusive and diverse environment that foster equal opportunities to all employees of different backgrounds, ages, gender, races, nationalities, religion, orientation and disabilities, etc. Um, and was, when setting up this Solvi One Dignity program, we put the dignity at the center of, of, of our conversation, of the dialogue, because if I respect you, if I'm interested, curious about who you are, by your background, I mean, the, the differences, they just disappear. And, and then I'm, I'm, I'm make you, making you feel uh, that you are welcome, that you are listened to, because diversity can join you. But if you don't listen to it, it leaves you. And in general, the best leave first. So we started really thinking with our teams about that. We co-construct it at all levels for professionals, for white colors, for blue colors, with nine concrete objectives. And we made this, again, part of our strategy. Strategy. So how we measure it, we have an inclusion survey is for me equally important than the engagements one, the traditional one. We apply this performance routine, uh, not only for the diversity targets, but also for inclusion. Uh, we decided to go for, for, for a group and worldwide comprehensive survey. I was proud recently to see 65% of our employees, including blue colors, took part of the survey. Um, we were innovative to fill in some of the data gaps we have, for example, since we typically cannot collect ethnic origin or sexual orientation data. We use the survey as an opportunity for our employees to voluntarily self-identify if they feel safe, if they feel okay, in accordance with all local data privacy laws, of course. Um, and this is, you know, giving us a comprehensive picture today. And we have, uh, like Jim and Dow, you know, uh, employee resource group, LGBTQs, and people are making their coming out, uh, you know, since then, because they just feel safe and it's part of it. We also, you know, we, um, uh, we, have, we, we are pushing this performance culture on the DNI. In fact, I'm always amazed by the capacity of our business leaders to translate DNI issues when 
you make it part of their strategy, it impacts their pockets because 10 percent of our uh, of our variable bonus uh, is linked to Solvay One Planet. So, so they are translate, translating it in their business language. A member of our material leadership recently was comparing the pay gap, which we are going to publish for the first time in our history in our coming uh, annual report. He compared the pay gap problem to a price scatter issue. Uh, he made me smile and, and it immediately resonated with the team. Uh, it's only by making d and a business topic because it impacts the pockets again, it impacts the bottom line that we can embed it in our culture. We are also, Leila, looking at women in STEM. You know that the access and the, I'm passionate about science, technology, engineering and math areas. Access of women to STEM and, the, in, and in the chemical industry is low and slow. Uh, in France and the UK, I, I looked at the 2021 number, women are still representing about probably 30 percent of STEM students and the number has hardly moved since a decade. So in our initiatives, at Solvay to promote women in STEM, we look for impacts and follow that carefully. For example, one historical partnership we have uh, in, in Belgium uh, in our headquarters to promote STEM with underprivileged children and students. It reached 600 people last year. This can only be achieved thanks to the mobilization of our employees and more. We also look at outside perspective it's important we cannot do it alone and i think there are a lot of best practices uh, we need the outside in at solve uh, this takes many forms uh, we took external benchmarking such as uh, diversity inc and Disab disability in in the us we look forward to be challenged and you know we actively contribute obviously to industry group and the wbcsd which i have the honor to chair now but also looking at the equity agenda <clears throat> and the new business commission tackling inequality. Um, finally, I, I've been all my career against quotas <laughs> because I'm a pure product of meritocracy. And recently I realized in my, you know, my career and the two last companies I had the honor to lead as, as a CEO, um, I had a hard time to leave a legacy where parity, where uh, diversity was in the room when I left the room. <laughs> And I ask myself, where are those invisible you know, minorities? So we launched the 8th of March, just a few days ago, uh, at the Women's Day, a Solvay leadership community with 49% uh, of women. Uh, they are from all different levels. They are high potential. They were invisible maybe to the leaders in Brussels. Um, and we are trying to educate, groom them, mentor them, sponsor them and say, we are going to be your mentor and sponsor, right? So not leave and say what, what I did. So I hope that two years from now, um, we'll see more women, more minorities in senior position, more awareness, better processes, right? Um, more, more women starting STEM studies, right? It starts at school eh, with your professors, with your families, inclusion of people with disabilities like you and me. So I believe that every small progress counts, Leila, and will make a difference. I think, Leila, um, Ilham makes a great point uh, about the visibility. And you need, you need that visibility. And you also need the organization to be more diverse uh, when, when you have job openings about the candidate slate. You need them to, we have a job posting system, but we have to post these jobs at all levels. And then we also have a diverse uh, hiring slate. So you know the hiring manager plus other diverse members join that. And by having diverse candidates and a diverse hiring slate, we've seen an immediate impact on the numbers. And, and, but you have to work, as Elam described, it, it has to be very intentional. Uh, you just can't put it out there and expect that people are naturally going to gravitate to it. You have to really work at it and, and make people engage. I think if I could add to that, um, Jim, I agree. I think having diverse candidate slates, having diverse interview slates um, are really important. Ultimately, what this all points to is equality of opportunity. And, and I think that's something that we've got to move more towards is the opportunity that everyone has an opportunity and that uh, training and development is not the same for everybody. I mean, if you think about somebody in Asia compared to Europe, to US, 
they may, they may need different types of leadership training to be ready to move up to higher roles. Um, so I, I, I think when I think about uh, the DEI work that we're doing here at Grace, I think about um, how do we create more opportunity for everybody um, through training. And, and the other thing that I mentioned to my team here after I joined, when we talked about DEI, is that um, I, I think structure is really important. So many of the things my colleagues have mentioned about um, leadership from the top, engagement from the top, um, doing the surveys and the focus groups. But I think embedded in all of that is listening, listening to our people and listening to what they're telling us. And, and I said to my team here after I joined that um, if we're not a little bit uncomfortable, we're probably not doing enough. And so we've got to have conversations that really get at the heart of what's on people's mind. And sometimes that may feel a little bit uncomfortable, but I think out of that discomfort comes a lot of good. And if we focus on equality of opportunity, I think the outcomes and, and, and all of the things that we measure really just happen. And may I just finish by saying from a, from a, I think it's, everyone's touched on it, but measurement is important from the top down to hold yourself accountable for what's there. It is difficult to get that information. And we, you know, ICIS and across Relex group try and encourage people to fill information in within data privacy laws that we're allowed to. But um, I mean, fortunately in ICIS from a gender perspective, we're 50, 50 across risk, not so much, but in, in data and technology, you know, the female population in technology is low. So we run a lot of programs. So currently we're 26% female in technology. We want to get that over 30 in the next three years, but the industry average is only 17. So we've got a lot of work to do to encourage people in. And, and the chemical industry has a brilliant role to play there. I've only been in it three years. I'm new to it. And, uh, uh, and, and um, you know, it, when, you, when you actually get into it and you realise how good it is, you know, that nearly every manufactured good on the, good on the planet involve, involve chemicals and it adds 1.1 trillion a year to the global GDP. And the industry is going to need this breadth of thought because it solves some of the most important issues of our time. You know, plastic waste, circular economy, decarbonisation, electric vehicles, you know, and, and, and we have to have the brightest talent in the industry to solve those key problems. And so it's, it's leadership like this that's creating the environment for that to happen. And, you know, the next generation, they want to solve the world's biggest problems. They want to have, they're very purpose-driven. Um, as I think many of us are, and Dean points to many of the things where the chemical industry can have impact, we've got to be able to attract more of the younger talent to STEM education. I read a statistic recently that um, by 2030, at the rate that we're going today, 60% of the STEM graduates will come from China and India. How do we get more global participation in STEM? Um, without plastics, I think most people would agree that they couldn't undertake everyday life with the convenience and, and the food security and all the things that plastics provide. Um, clearly, the waste has to be addressed, and there's a lot of work on, underway. But I think these are the sort of purposes or purpose-driven sort of mission that I think we can engage the younger minds into and get them to come to our industry from around the world and have better STEM participation. But they've also have to see that there are more people like them in the workplace where they are being attracted to go to. And that's another reason why you asked earlier, why is diversity important? Well, I think in order to attract all of the talent, the workplace has to have people where students say, there's someone like me who works there. Absolutely, Bob. This is the importance of representation and visible representation and hearing from you all why it is so key uh, to the industry specifically. Um, and Ilham, I, I wonder whether I can loop back to you here uh, on this importance in the chemi uh, chemical uh, chemical industry um, in particular when it comes to say women in, in STEM because this is a classically uh, male dominated industry. 
Uh, and um, again, um, we've seen a number of each and every one of you are driving various different initiatives. Um, but how um, and why is this so important for us to keep the movement on, in particular within the chemical industry and in particular within STEM? Yeah, because, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it starts at school, right? With um, And even in, you know, at home, um, I always, when I mentor young girls, uh, be it in Brussels or in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia or when I was living in the US, first of all, they need to find their passion and be vocal about that. And, and I hope the importance of the teachers at school, I mean, my, my scientific teachers made me, gave me the love of sciences and, and that's what I was, I wanted for myself and and I could follow my dreams and then along the way I found uh, teachers or or sponsors during my PhD uh, great em employers like Dow and others who who offered me at Dow I was the first general manager in in the Middle East right traveling in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, and negotiating deals so when you know when you want something you need to go after it and then um, you know find your obviously we abused of uh, abuse of mentoring but also find your sponsor your sponsors um, and yes science sciences are important I mean uh, humanity is facing huge challenges from uh, the climate the, the, the global warming and the climate change to water scarcity to biodiversity challenges and we need men and women and we cannot just in your half of the world population we need that ingenuity in the room we need it badly and 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 uh, the one plus one equal three here so so yeah, I think uh, there is an attrition. We lose uh, girls and women, um, you know, along the way in the science, technology, engineering, and math. And I call on the teachers. I call on uh, the employers, right, to force that diversity when they have the hot jobs and critical jobs, and short lists. Uh, you know, diversity candidates, that's what we are doing at Solve. Now I am forcing 50%, I used to do 30%, it didn't work. So I'm forcing 50% of minorities for all my critical jobs, and uh, there are around 100 at Solve of, you know, really hot critical out of the 23,000. And, you know, sometimes the headhunters on my team, they said, we don't find them. I said, go back and find them. Uh, and of course, the best wins. Huh? So I think it's important for for the future of humanity for and we we have all you know sisters we are all you know we have minorities around us we have uh, handicaps uh, and I think it's just we are penalizing our company our business if we don't tap into that beautiful pipeline of uh, ingenuity diversity of thought um, and Bob said it you know um, we need to build that routine if I can do it personally everybody can do it so, yeah, we, we have to share the, the, the stories, the business case. We have to do our parts, and I hope we cannot do it alone. I think the importance of the value chain is critical, right? Um, I, I learned from Dow in, during when I was an employee, but recently we also uh, we welcomed uh, uh, someone from Dow, uh, North America Business uh, President Louis Vega, uh, to be a guest speaker for the launch of our own events at Solve, and it was very inspiring. So I think we need to build that, uh, you know, supply chain ecosystem, uh, specifically in in the chemical industry where we need more women. Back to you. And I, I think, Leila, just um, uh, another point as well. The, the industry, I think it, to order to attract women, for example, to this industry, we have to put up role models that they can see what can be done. Ilham is a great role model for a, a woman with a STEM background who can come into this industry and be very, very successful. And we have to be not afraid to put them up. This industry is very technically oriented engineers sometimes have a tendency, you know, everything is by the book. And, and like, if you're celebrating successes, you know, sometimes people are like, you know, why are we doing that? I don't understand why that's uh, important. Well, it's hugely important. Uh, you know, there's a, a mindset out there that manufacturing jobs are a thing of the past. Yet, 
what people don't understand is we're digitalizing all of these companies and these processes. You can do the same kind of work here that you do at Google or Amazon or Uber. Uh, the computing power, the digital technology, the process technology that's being developed here is unbelievable. And the industry right now is in the process of changing the whole face of the industry. In the next 30 years in this industry is going to be a dramatic change. That is exciting. There's huge dignity in working in manufacturing. There's huge dignity in working in these jobs. Most of us work with companies where people have spent their careers and they've put their children through school and their children have come to work. We have five generations of people that work at Dow. What is wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. We have to showcase that. That's what attracts people into the industry. That's what attracts young people in. By the way, that's what attracts our customers. Um, they look at how you treat each other. They look at how we work together across companies. They look at how the company works together and they make a conscious decision. They say, I wanna work with them because I like the way they do things. I like the way they treat their people. And if they treat each other that way, I think they're going to treat me that way. And, you know, I think you've got three examples here of companies that do that. We need the industry to embrace that because I think we have huge positive stories to tell. Yeah, and I, I would very simply put, I think for young people who may be watching this and considering careers, if you want to have a positive impact on the planet for the future, come to the chemical industry. There's a lot of opportunity a lot of purpose, and you can have an impact here and do great things for generations. Dean, anything to add on top of this? Because I'm hearing people, purpose, planet, with people clearly at the absolute center of this uh, chemical industry. Uh, this is one that touches every single one of our lives, whether we know it or not, visibly and invisibly. Um, and it really is an industry uh, that we're now seeing step up to the fore with these great leaders. And so um, one, um, arguably, that is incredibly attractive, that, that can really leave a lasting legacy. Absolutely. I mean, and, and you, you just heard the, the, the greatness and the opportunity and how that 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 diverse talent is needed for the industry and the world to achieve its potential. I, the, the one thing I'd, I'd say is the easy thing to do, and this isn't just a leadership responsibility of the great leaders we have on, on the call, it's everybody's responsibility. The easy thing to do is to do nothing. And you have to work at it. And a, and, and a wonderful um, female African-American bundle of energy sales leader I have, she uses a phrase, she says, if you're not intentionally including, you're unintentionally excluding. And, and it takes work from everybody all of the time to get this right. And it's a cultural, you know, culture is everybody's responsibility. So my call to action is to, is to, is to do exactly what the, the eminence of these leaders on the call are are doing and, and, and make sure that we all go together. If you think about our industry today, um, I, I think um, Ilham, Jim, Dean, all of my peers in the industry would say that safety is an imperative and it's built into sort of the fabric of our companies. And we think about strong safety performance translating into the kind of discipline that creates strong business performance well, imagine in the not too distant future, diversity, equity, and inclusion become a part of the fabric of our companies and become like safety, an imperative, something that we don't think about, we just do every day because we realize that it's important for the success of our companies in the long term. Um, it doesn't need to be programmatic. It just becomes a part of what we do every day. It's a corporate responsibility, not just to the own, your own organization, the industry and the world. And I often say to the staff, you know, within our organization, we can control that and we can have the culture and the society that we want on the outside of our organization. And if, if, if we all do that, then the world will be in a much better place. And maybe on my side, uh, for the woman, you're right, I will make a call that the chemical industry is probably the sexiest industry you can work in. I mean, I worked in four continents. Uh, I was given, you know, a chance to, to live in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to work in Japan. I lived in the US, now I'm back to Europe. 
it's just fascinating if you have the passion if you follow your dreams if your dreams are bigger than than the one you can even handle and the chemical industry look at the challenges we are facing again climate change water scarcity uh, net zero there will be no, no net zero without without chemistry chemistry is the mother of all industry we are all over the place uh, we are in batteries we are in green hydrogen we are in uh, light weighing in in digitalization in you know natural resources conversation uh, conservation circularity all of this is chemistry and we need this and i think the covid 19 and what's happened during the confinement uh, by the way most of our plants didn't shut down because we were recognized essential around the world so i think it's a call to to not think chemical industry is part of the problem actually it's part of the solution and we need diversity in the room. We need badly those young talents from, from all backgrounds, Dif diversity of thoughts to really enrich and actually s just uh, solve the most challenging problems humanity is going to face and leave a better world for our kids. So we've heard some incredibly rich and insightful learnings from each of our esteemed panelists. And before we run out of time, I'd love to come uh, to everyone um, and hear uh, one final remark on why we must, as leaders, drive a call to action into the global chemical industry and beyond. Dean. Yeah, as we've heard, that the, the industry has made some excellent um, progress in, in many of the facets of DNI, but we're still a long, long way to go and we can never go fast enough. I think as we've as we've heard, the first thing we have to do as an industry is actually measure it and hold ourselves accountable. And that's as leaders, but as organisations as a whole. Um, and then we can begin to use some of the tools that we've heard today around ERGs and inclusion training and hiring and 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 it's wonderful to hear um, incentivization is based around culture and inclusion and diversity too. So all of those things obviously begin to make a difference, but it does take everybody. I, I'm, I'm pleased from a leadership perspective, and my call to other leaders is to, is to follow suit and sign up for those commitments. Um, but it's top down and bottom up. And I think everybody in the industry has an obligation here to ensure that we really push forward and, uh, and move in the right direction to kind of hand the shirt over and our society and organisations in a better place than what we found. You, Dean, and, and, and coming to yourself, Bob, Jim, and then uh, finally, Ilham. Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, DEI is not a program. It's an imperative. It's something that will lead to business success. And, and I think at the heart of this, beyond the statistics and the leadership from the top, it is really a matter of the heart. I think it's engaging our people. It's listening um, and ultimately equality of opportunity. How do we create opportunity for everyone so that they can realize their potential, do what they thought otherwise they couldn't do because of the disadvantages they had? Let's create opportunity for everybody and, and make DE&I as commonplace and part of the fabric as safety is today in our, in our industry. Yeah, I think, uh, Leila, I, I agree with uh, Dean and Bob. I, I would say you have to lead from the top. Um, one of the reasons I came out uh, the way I did was I, I had a friend uh, in, a, in a pretty high level job who had been outed uh, publicly in a, in a very nasty way. And I said, you know, that's not the way I want to have it happen. I want it to be a positive example for people. And if you're working in a company and you've got somebody senior leadership that's unafraid, that's afraid to come out, you know, what does that say to them? What does that say to some employee in the company that, that they should be afraid to come out because they know somebody in the company's gay, but in the closet? And I said, look, we, we have to change this equation. Uh, if I can come out and set a positive example, that's going to make a big change in the organization. I think everybody can do that. Um, at the end of the day, all we have is each other. And this is about community. And I think that's where Dean was going. You have an outsized impact on the community, not just your company community, but the greater community around you. Your influence is much bigger than you think. Um, people watch what you do. They can see it. They don't, you don't need to explain it to them. 
they'll see your actions and that will have a big impact on how they how they act and what they do well a lot has been said leila and i think there is a sense of urgency here like um, in case of climate in case of our planet right there is really a case for sense of urgency on the diversity equality and inclusion um it, it, if you follow the rate of increase, for example, of women in leadership in the last three years, we would reach gender parity in 2065 or 2070. So acceleration is a mess. And I truly believe, like it was said, that um, you know, diversity is what you see, but equality and inclusion is what you do. And equity is just not negotiable. I mean, let's remove undesired in, in pay gaps and close them, ensure fair recruitment, ensure equitable access to career opportunities and developments. And the inclusion has been always the most challenging to do in my career because it's the air you breathe. It's invisible, but it's there. You need it. It's vital. But we need to build that inclusive employee experience. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's a culture where individuals feel empowered to speak out to speak up when they experience or witness non-inclusive behavior and they bring finally you know their whole self uh, at work and and the consequence will be a diverse uh, you know uh, uh, organization uh, where people you know they just thrive and 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 you know bring their whole self to work and and win and if the employees win and are engaged the company wins Thank you all ever so much indeed for your time on this panel. I, I think we can all agree that this has been not only inspirational, uh, but it is so, um, so key for us now to really look at keeping the momentum on when it comes to all aspects of diversity, inclusion, belonging and equity, in particular uh, within the broader global chemical industry. Uh, as we've heard from you all, business has really got this transformative power to change and contribute to a more open and diverse and inclusive society. And as each of you have referenced, we can really only accomplish this by from starting within our organizations and starting within ourselves, quite, quite frankly. Uh, many of us know intuitively that diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity is really good for business. But now, as we've heard from each of you, we've got to be purposeful. We've got to look at those positive targets. We've got to look at the beauty within the talent pipeline that has been discussed. We've got to be able to remove those barriers in order to allow uh, equality to thrive. We, we, we'd we love to think that we live in this equal society. Um, however, we don't. And so we must pay attention more so to equity. How can we remove the blockers? How can we really level the playing field? And um, one way in which all that are listening in today can do that is by using your voice, use your voice, use your experience, use your leadership, each and every one of the brilliant, brilliant uh, chief execs on this panel today are doing uh, just that. And it is that vulnerability, that candid openness that really inspires change. It's the, the hearts and the minds that we must win, as well as also putting the intentions, the purpose, the metrics uh, behind each and every one of those actions. And let's face it, our future generations of leaders will judge us on this. They will judge us on this. They care so deeply about purpose and intent uh, that we really owe it uh, to those future generations of leaders, the world and, and, and society and the chemical industry um, absolutely can do that. Uh, you've absolutely sold me all um, on the chemical industry. It, it, is the, uh, it is the mother of all industries, as it's famously known, and it is um, intuitively, clearly, very, very sexy. So uh, let's make sure uh, that we do take action now that we recognize um, that our CEOs are beacons of change. And if you aren't already involved uh, in making sure uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity is at the front of your organization agenda um, or on the minds of your CEOs, um, this panel really uh, you know, is testament uh, 
uh, to why we must act now. Uh, we must continue to be impatient. So thank you all ever so much. It has been a pleasure and it has been a true honor uh, to chair this panel. Uh, you are all uh, brilliant inspirations, uh, Ilham, Bob, Jim, Dean, thank you all ever so much indeed on behalf of ICIS and the broader Relex group and myself personally. Mm -hmm.